Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, as you know, there are millions of people in this country with heart disease. In fact, it's the number one killer of both men and women in the U.S. And the majority of those people have CAD, or coronary artery disease. And that's when the major blood vessels that supply the muscles of your heart, uh, they supply blood, they supply nutrients, they supply, uh, supply oxygen, and when they become damaged or diseased, it's called coronary artery disease. And that, of course, is usually the result of cholesterol-containing deposits called plaque, along with a little informa- inflammation, and it is a process that we know as atherosclerosis. When the plaque builds up, it narrows your coronary arteries, and that decreases the blood flow to your heart. Eventually, that can cause symptoms that you might recognize, chest pain, shortness of breath, a complete blockage can even cause a heart attack. And we know there's lots of things that you can do to prevent heart disease, but what about reversing the damage that has already been done? Is that possible? Let's find out from a Mayo Clinic preventive cardiologist, Dr. Stephen Kopetsky. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me. Dr. Kopetsky, good to see you. You know, I once heard you say that you wanted to start a coronary artery disease reversal clinic suggesting that, in fact, if your coronary arteries were diseased, you could make them better. Yes, very clearly you can. We have the clinic. We just don't call it that, unfortunately. (laughs) But the data, the studies have shown you can reverse heart disease. You can reverse this narrowing of the arteries to the heart. As you mentioned, inflammation or the irritation of the lining of the artery is very important to reduce because that's what actually causes the blood clot to form and the heart attack to occur. And why do you get the inflammation in the first place? Well, that's a great question. There are many things that cause inflammation, smoking, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes. If you don't do those, you stop the progression of heart disease or the narrowing. But it's really diet, stress control, exercise that will help not only stop the progression, but actually promote the regression or the opening up of the artery. Is there one of those that's most important? Diet, stress control. Number one risk factor now for early death and disease in the United States and soon to be the world, diet. Diet. It used to be smoking? Smoking, uh, smoking was, yeah. Uh, So when you say diet, does that mean you have to become a vegetarian to reverse this damage or? I'm going broth broth only from here on. (laughs) Right. No, no, you don't need to be a vegetarian, but it helps if you go more towards more plant-based. So in the Mediterranean diet that we've talked about here before, it has four things that aren't vegetarian in it. Red meat, which it suggested three ounces a day, a deck of cards. Fish, you know, eat three or four times a week. Uh, Dairy products, you know, which is, um, it's very limited, just like one pat of butter a day. And then uh, things like poultry, white meat, uh, you know, turkey or chicken, poultry. If you can eat most of your calories being plant-based, fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and then to get full on that stuff and add in a little bit of these other things. Ice okay. cream? Uh, it's the, that's the dairy. Uh, you can have <laughs> low-fat or no-fat yogurt. Yeah. A little but bit. No, no ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're doing lots of the other things, too, that's the balance part. If you're doing the exercising and mm-hmm. watching, I don't know, blood sugar levels, all of it. It's all important. It's all important. And the two big things, of course, are the, uh, the nutrition and the exercise. But the two things that Americans have forgotten about, and it's ubiquitous, is stress and social support and sleep. They all think, well, everybody's under stress, don't worry about it, and I don't get much sleep, and I never am gonna, so don't worry about that either. Those two are huge because they don't allow you to have resiliency and come back and change your lifestyle and make and, and lower your stress level. So your heart can be healthier if you get better sleep and reduce your stress. There is no doubt about that. Now, what about cholesterol? Do we still worry mm-hmm. about that? Well, cholesterol, uh, the guidelines have come out, and there'll be a new paper probably soon. They'll say cholesterol isn't that important. They said that a couple of years ago. And all the press picked up on was that, cholesterol not important. If they would read the article, it would say that we eat so much saturated fat and animal fat and saturated plant fat in this country that the cholesterol we take in isn't as important as it used to be. So you really ought to cut down both the cholesterol and the saturated fat. But you still believe in statins for people who have elevated cholesterol, or are you more suggesting that it can be controlled with diet? It, in most patients, it can be controlled with diet, but it takes a pretty radical change, and we ask them to migrate to a new diet over one to two years because you can't just 
do it tomorrow. So statins have been around for a long time, and there are a lot of people taking statins mm-hmm. still, right? Right. Um, any long-term side effects that you've identified? You know, we've, uh, we have found uh, that it can lead to increased incidence of diabetes, but it's usually an earlier occurrence of diabetes than if you weren't on the statin. So if you are obese, have high fasting blood sugar, have metabolic syndrome with a big paunch, uh, you'll go into uh, become a diabetic about three months earlier than if you weren't on the statin. But for every one patient gets diabetes, five heart attacks are prevented. We've heard that term metabolic syndrome yeah. a, a, a lot, and it's difficult to understand for uh us and our listeners, <laughs> yes. explain that for yeah. us, will you? Metabolic, metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome has five factors. One, the main one is the big paunch, big abdominal obesity, which is a very active fat. It puts out chemicals that are bad for us. It makes us more insulin resistant. It which in- for women going through menopause, that's where you're likely to gain weight. Yeah, and women, it's really a higher risk factor okay. for them. Uh, second is blood pressure that's elevated. Third is the low HDL or low good cholesterol that cleans out the arteries. And then the, uh, um, the other thing would be uh, uh, things like uh, blood pressure. And um, uh, the, uh, those are the factors that really lead to more inflammation. And if you can control those, you're much better off. We've heard you talk about fish oil before. And as I recall, you're a proponent. Uh, I want to know if you still are, and is that for everybody, or is that just for people with heart disease? Well, it, fish oil helps a lot of people, and not just people with heart disease. You know, recent studies show that high-dose fish oil, EPA, specifically a certain type of EPA, which is the thing you find on the bottle when you buy in the store, will reduce uh, heart attacks if you have real high triglycerides, even if your LDL is controlled. All right, a drug called Vasipa just read that the FDA approved an expanded use of this fish oil drug. Do you use right. it? That's the one. That's Vasipa. the EPA. That's yeah, the V A S C E P A is how it's spelled. And that's the one that they approved, and that's the one that showed benefit. When it comes to fish and fish oil, uh, if you don't like fish and you're trying to do the Mediterranean mm-hmm. diet, but you're not eating fish, mm-hmm. does fish oil take its place? Or is that something that you would want to use both of them, fish you, and fish oil? Well, you'd like ideally to use both of them. And it's better to have the fish and you know, there's no pill that replaces lifestyle. And the Mediterranean diet is more than just a diet. It's a lifestyle. You know, stop by the store on the way home, pick up the, uh, the fish fresh, take it home, take a while to cook it. Sit for a couple hours with your family as you eat it and talk about the day. Don't just, you know, eat it on the way to the <laughs> soccer game or something. All right, aspirin, baby aspirin. Who should be taking it? You still uh, think it's a preventive for people who have had heart disease or have heart disease? Yeah, if you have had heart disease, aspirin is beneficial. There's no, there's no uh, argument about that unless you have bleeding problems from it. If you don't have heart disease, it's not as helpful as we used to think it was. You have to be a higher risk for heart attack over the next 10 years, 10, 12, 15% risk. Those people benefit. But the average person, which is lower, like 7, 8% risk, they, they probably wouldn't benefit. And how does it work? Uh, it stops the uh, inflammation in the lining of the arteries, and it also stops the blood clot formation in the lining of the artery. When uh, exercise is something that you're supposed to do, I think that can be in- intimidating for people. When you say exercise is what a patient needs to do, what does that mean? Yeah. Physical activity is why I've gone to more because exercise, they kind of fold across their arms and, you know, and look at the ceiling. <laughs> and physical activity is two things. One, don't be sedentary. Every hour, get up and move around for three or four minutes. A lot of the big corporations around this country and the world now have a thing every hour where you get up and you move around. So go up two floors to go to the bathroom. Go talk to a, a colleague instead of sending him an email. The second thing is intense physical activity, which is what we used to do a lot of. When you do intense activity, three great things happen very quickly. One is the heart is told to pump more blood because the muscles say, hey, we're running from the saber-toothed tiger. we got to try to survive. The second thing is the blood vessels get bigger, which lowers blood pressure. And the third thing is the muscles say, okay, belly fat, you're up next. If we survive this run from the saber-toothed tiger, I need more energy because I only have 20 minutes of energy in my cell. You start breaking down and sending me extra energy because that's where we put extra calories as an adult. So it's the American dream, I call it. You can actually, we've shown here with research, you can reduce abdominal fat with interval activity. All right, one final question. A study from the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the smart guys, the heart guys, researchers have found that eating chili peppers regularly can cut the risk of death from heart disease and stroke. True? That was the number one read article last year in the Jack. And so it is true. And it's funny about it. It's not just regular bell peppers. These are hot peppers. And this was in addition to a Mediterranean diet. 
So, and the, they say, why? Well, maybe it's inflammation. It didn't, didn't affect inflammation. Uh, maybe it's vasodilatation because you get hot and your blood pressure goes down. It didn't affect that. But it looks like it may be uh, some of the antioxidants that are in there. And some of these peppers have more. All right. Can't argue with that. Wow. <laughs> Peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> Heart disease, far and away the number one killer of both men and women in this country. CAD, coronary artery disease, is usually the culprit. Lifestyle changes can help prevent it, and it can actually be reversed. And don't forget the chili peppers. No. Our thanks to Dr. Stephen Kopetsky, preventive cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks, Dr. Kopetsky. Thanks for having me.